Welcome to episode 123 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. If you like the podcast, I hope you leave a comment or rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your ratings and comments help new people find the show, or even better, if you know someone you think will like the show, tell them about it. Some of my favorite podcasts became my favorites because somebody I knew told me about them. If you want to tell me about somebody that you introduced to this show or the person who introduced you or you just want to drop me a line with your questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. You can find Stageworthy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. If you want to drop me a line, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Phil Rickaby, and my website is PhilRickaby.com. Guys, I know that you know that the Fringe season is fast approaching, and if you have a show in the Fringe, you have to know that these days social media is the best way to target your audience for Fringe. But I know how it is. You're busy with rehearsal, and promoting your show just isn't on your mind yet, but it should be. Now, I know it's not even May yet, and you think that there's plenty of time, but I know that these things end up getting pushed to the last minute. So you need to start thinking about how you're going to promote your show. And I know it all seems scary because you aren't sure how to strategize. Or maybe you don't know what a boosted post is or how to make your ad pop. Maybe you don't even know what web optimization means. And that's okay. Because Adriana Prosser can do that for you with her fringe social media packages. Now, I've worked with Adriana before and I can tell you that man, she knows her stuff. And her social media marketing campaigns have translated to bums in seats. And you know, after all the work that you put into your show, that's what you really want. People to see the show. Adriana can help you do that. So find her on Twitter, at Adriana P, or on her website, adriana-prosser.com. This week, my guest is playwright Stephen Neer. Stephen is appearing in Same Boat Theatre's Your Own Sons, which he also wrote at the Pearl Company Arts Centre in Hamilton, playing until April 28th. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was talking with with Ryan Saro, yeah, uh, like maybe two weeks ago. Uh-huh. We, were, we sort of talked about the the like doing, um, like the two Hamiltons. There's Arts Hamilton, which is a bit younger, a bit hipstery, yeah. but there's also Steel Town, yeah, Hamilton, yeah. So, and you've got these two parallel places that exist in the same place. Yeah, it's true, you know, but it's it's. I guess the, the funny thing that I've discovered is that, like, both audiences are are eager to see anything, <clears> right? <throat> like, like honestly, Steel Town, Steel Town, Hamilton, and Arts Hamilton <clears throat> will will come out to see just about anything. The <clears throat> only difference is, for my money, is that when Steel Town Hamilton sees a show or sees a piece of work that is up Hamilton, yeah. Then they come out in droves. Oh shit, really? Well, oh, they come out in uh, huge droves, right? Mm-hmm. Like anything that, anything that has a sense of being a, uh, you know, small town makes good mm-hmm. or, or a local interest story, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. they flock to. And that runs the gamut from I'm new to Hamilton and I'm discovering what sure. it is to be Hamiltonian. Oh, we'll go there. We'll totally mm-hmm. support you. Um, to, you know, the, umpteenth revival of how could you mrs dick <laughs> right which yeah. is yeah which is about as close as you know you can get to uh to sort of you know core you know you know the 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 the, mm. the, the favorite narrative of sure. of the city right like well like mm. i don't I, I mean i think you you must know her i but I'm, her name is escaping me now like the she was she was she was a regular at the hamilton fringe and she did a she did a show. Her first show was like about baking, uh, cupcakes or oh, something like that. Sure. Oh, and then she followed it up with a show called Bootlegger's Wife. Victoria Murdoch. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so Bootlegger's Wife, like, yeah. and made out with like gangbusters. Mm-hmm. 
Partially because, I mean, she's obviously a gifted performer, but yeah. honestly, partially because she, like, based it on Rocco, what's his face, mm. who was, like, this famous Hamilton rum runner, mm. right? And gangster. And yeah. Hamilton loves its gangsters. Too, well, I right? mean. So. And most places that have gangsters love their gangsters. Love their gangsters, yeah, 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 I know, yeah. yeah. But it's just like, I don't know, I it's. There, there was a show that was written many years ago. I forget the, I forget the play, playwright's name, but it was called Glory Days, and it was a musical about the steel strike mm. at Stelco. Mm. And I've always wondered what would happen if that was revived today. Mm. Like, like it would, it would probably go over like gangbusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what the? I found there's this state of of of, of art criticism in Hamilton, at least theater criticism in in Hamilton, which I found a little bit lacking. Uh, when I was there for, Fringe. I was about to say what the intercom. Well, that, I mean, that is the thing is that is that um, their theater criticism doesn't exist because they're not nothing is critical right. of the theater. At least what I was seeing for Fringe is like I like. Of course, when I was doing Fringe, the first thing you do when you, when the reviews come out is like, what's my review? Right. Oh, sorry. Right. I wonder about so and so show. Oh yeah. I wonder what they said about that show. I didn't like. Uh, oh, 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 that, oh. <laughs> and so you're like, oh, I've heard terrible things about this. Uh, oh, like yeah. nobody gets a bad review. Nobody gets a bad review. And what was I found was interesting is that, you know, I was in a, I was, uh, my show was pick of the venue. Yeah. And my numbers went down after really? that. Yeah. Not, I mean, not like hugely, but it was like, <laughs> okay. there was a noticeable. That is surprising. There was a noticeable drop. Mind you, you were in probably one of the worst venues. Uh, I'm sorry to say. I kind of liked it for I my know, show. No, but... no, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Artistically, it worked for yes. your show, but in my opinion, it's one of the worst venues. <laughs> it's one of the worst venues. I'm but it was. It, I did Mr. Right now. Yeah. It. Hey. It. It's just interesting that, um, and I sort of chalked up the, like a drop in the numbers to, I think audiences, when they see shit, like after a while, if you see everything getting a good review and then you go to see it, either you believe that you don't understand theater because they're like, they raved about this show and this was not a good show. And you start to distrust either the reviewer or your own, right. your own ability to like, maybe theater is just not for me. Interesting. You know, like being, a, there's one thing, it's being a booster is fine, but also like, Criticism is important. Criticism is important. And and I think, I mean, we've started to see some changes. Mm. We've started to see um, View Magazine had a, had a turnover mm. in terms of, of their criticism uh, just last year, the year before. Um, mm. You know, so... So the person that was writing the reviews was was approaching things from a bit more of an educated perspective. Yeah. The spec is, I mean, the spec is the spec... Or, um, mm. I don't know. Like, I keep on waiting for an active theater blog like Mooney to come mm. on board, and I've been in touch with Megan about it, and but she maintains, you know, I can't really do it, uh, you know, unless there's someone on the ground to, to do it, which is ironic. I mean, I've actually spoken to Leanne about mm. this, and Leanne's like thought, well, maybe I could do that because she edits for sure. Megan during during Toronto for Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's a funny thing because I know I could never. I could never do theater criticism because I'm actually making the work. Well, I actually think that that's a dangerous thing to do. And, you know, I've had people who are like, oh, with the podcast, do you do reviews? I'm like, absolutely not. <clears throat> absolutely not. Because I, first off, I do this to boost. Mm -hmm. I like to talk about theater. Um, when you criticize theater and you're making theater, it becomes a different thing. It does. It does. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I guess the thing, the, the conundrum for me then is that you're right. Does it, does it, is it? Are we, are we improving the ecology of mm -hmm. theater in the city mm -hmm. by continually boosting our work? Right. Yeah. I don't know. It's 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 a strange thing because yeah. I mean, if you're going to criticize, if you're going to be openly honest, then you got to be openly honest with everybody. And sure. That means like, okay, I'm going to see community theater and I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. Yeah. Um. And you know. Because the theater community is so insular yeah. in Hamilton, you're going to be, you know, taking a taking a newspaper, sure, whapping the nose, sure, of a lot of the same people. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, like, like there are artists that that do shows in community theaters and approach it like like professional actors, sure. they're regulars. Yeah. I, um, I don't know if you ever met 
uh, Peter Gruner. Um, you may have come across him Maybe. During, during Fringe, but his wife, Deb, uh, she's, she's, I'm going to just say yeah. that she's as close as you can get to, to a regular, mm. like, She's almost as ubiquitous in Hamilton Theater as Meryl Streep is in, oh, in okay. Hollywood. Like, yeah, yeah. Like she's got, she's in that age range and she's like cast in all of these shows. Mm-hmm. Like to such a degree that like there was one year she was like four or five shows. <laughs> yeah. One right after the other, one mm. right after the other. And then she did Fringe. And it was, and you know, in that rent, in that route, she's like, she knows who she wants to work with, who she doesn't want to work sure. with. Sure. What theater she'll work with. You know, never been on a professional theater stage. Yeah. Never been on Aquarius. Yeah. Um, done plenty of, well, done some fringe. Not but I mean, if, 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 if you're, if you just, like, there's people who, who, for them, the community theater is all they need. Yeah. And, you know? and I guess the, the, the strange thing for me, though, is that sometimes, you know, you'll see a show in community theater that's really dynamite. Mm. And, you know, you need to, you need to be honest about, well, I'm going to, I got to give this its it's due, right? Sure. It's it's a good piece of theater. Yeah. But, you know, if we want theater to flourish as an art form, as a craft, then you're right. We have to, the the level of criticism, the level of educated criticism needs to go up. And that's what, that education is sometimes what is lacking. Sure. Absolutely. Informative. I mean, you know, but then you need critics to kind of engage artists directly, yeah. right? Like, yeah. like what, what, what type of shows were you doing three or four years ago versus mm-hmm. what are you doing now? And yeah. How, you know, like I, I mean, I always look at, look at the example of Kaplan yeah. you know, and how he, he was so known for getting to know artists, you know, during, sure. uh, during over the span of their career such that. He was able to write really informed reviews. Sure. He was also, I mean, the first time I sent a press release to to, to John Kaplan, um, he called to provide constructive criticism. Right. Absolutely. Like, because he genuinely wanted theater to be good and he wanted to help you make good theater. Yeah. Because if you hate theater, you're not going to do, you don't, like, why would you do theater criticism if you hate theater? Right. Yeah. Um. And if you don't want, like, you just need to want everybody, like, want the people to do well. Yeah. And, you know, that's giving everybody a good review does not help everybody to do well. Yeah. It lets everybody think, God, I can do, like, I don't even have to put effort into this shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Absolutely. They're going to love whatever, like, these people love whatever I do, even if I wasn't that confident about it. You know? It's like... (laughs) You know, well, and you know, and part of it, part of, I guess, the problem, too, that happens is that we have a, you know, you have a situation in, um, in, uh, reviews where, you know, the print, I mean, there's no money to pay reviewers. Sure. Or critics, yeah. Right. So then, then people are doing it out of pocket or on a volunteer basis. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that presents its own problems yeah. as well. I mean, you know, we have we have some really good informed reviewers mm-hmm. who basically work on their own. Yeah. Um, you know, but I mean, then these people they work other jobs and they get to see theater when they can see theater, sure. right? So, I don't know, it's I, that's a really tough one. Yeah. Um and it's tough know. because the I mean, I think years ago you were you mentioned that like there are more community theater uh, uh groups in Hamilton than there are professional theater groups Absolutely. is that still the case yeah yeah that still is yeah and so there's amount there's a certain amount of of you know you don't want to if you're reviewing shows and you're trying to cultivate stuff a lot of those community theaters may not be interested in the in being cultivated yeah because they have their audience yeah you know um it, it's it's a difficult one as a, if you were to be a reviewer going in there but I think I do think that if the Hamilton theater scene is going to flourish, there needs to be um, healthy criticism. Yeah, to be able to to say, but you know, criticism is not just to shit on things. No, you know, no, it's it's to be able to say this was lacking and this is why and that sort of thing. And that's mm-hmm. why it needs to be educated criticism. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's 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 a certain. As I said, I mean, yeah. I think there's, there's a real hunger mm-hmm. by, for, from audiences in, in the city for, 
for work that that speaks to them, right? Mm-hmm. And I always go back to the word authentic, right? Yeah. And, and, but I just think that it's you know work that work that's that's done half assed. Yeah. Um, you know, people can see that. People mm-hmm. can people can sense that. Um, but as I said, you know, like Hamilton really likes, really really appreciates. And any sort of out of that, Ham, I think Hamiltonian audience, Hamilton audiences really appreciate effort that they see as grassroots. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I love about Hamilton is it really is a place that you can, you can bring something that, that is half formed mm-hmm. and are experimenting on and yeah. just put it up in front of people and they'll buy it. They'll yeah. watch it. They'll like, they'll let you know what they think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you won't go broke. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, I mean, that part of that, I mean, you see, you see that type of attitude in the success, in the success of things like art crawl, Mm -hmm. you know, where, I mean, art crawl essentially started, um, you know, where a group of galleries along James North said, well, listen, we all have these art shows that are opening up. Why don't we just coordinate them? We'll open them on the same night. And then, and then that just kind of started, uh, started the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. There was a, there was a, a local art store that kind of helped push it along on social media in the public space. And then cafes would start pushing it as well. And now, but, it, but that didn't happen overnight. It no. didn't happen over like five years. Like it was, it was a sustained period. Yeah. Um, you know, and in the winter time, the art crawl still happens, but it's dead because it's cold. Of course. And uh, so it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I encounter people who talk about uh, wanting the theater scene to look just like, look just as vibrant as the visual arts scene. And I, I think, well, it will, but it's going to take time. Yeah. 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 Right. Like during, I mean, during the summer with the fringe, it explodes and mm-hmm. that's great. Uh, and the fringe has now done their, their winter festival, but you know, it's, it's, it's fits and starts. And also, it's it's not like theater is in, in Hamilton is centered along one in one geographic yeah area yeah yeah um, so so that's that's kind of the the thing that's kind of the 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 place where we I think that some of the difficulties that we find ourselves in mm-hmm. um, and you know I, I the other thing too I mean Hamilton's got a pretty big vibrant music scene but yeah. in a lot of ways too. The music scene there, I'm reading this lovely uh, book called uh, Evenings and Weekends, which is about the the sort of rise of the indie music scene. You know, mm. people like the Arkells and, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, you know, a host of other, host of other acts. Um, but it's, but it's very evident that it's built upon, uh, you know, these, these small little venues that yeah. host these artists that were all making, you know, bootleg or not bootleg, but that were making like small albums in the, in their basements. Yeah. Right. Um, so now what, what I, I think we see in Hamilton is, is artists embracing things like performing in non-traditional yeah. spaces, uh, or things like artists doing things at places like the staircase or mm-hmm. the Pearl company. I hope the Pearl company, the Pearl company is, is up for sale. Apparently. I, oh uh, shit. I don't know. We may be one of the last shows in there. I'm not certain. Mm. Um, I hope not. Cause it's a great space. That That is a, a great space. I mean, we did the, the last man on earth there That's many right, years yeah. ago and it was a great space to work in with, and, with like multiple performance spaces. Yeah. And they even, recall? they yeah. read, they redid the, the, the bit, like the, the bottom floor. Mm. So it's just a dedicated theater. Now. Well, it's shit. Like a thrust yeah. Stage. Nice. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I look at that. So I look at these sort of rental venues and I go, well, you know, these are the places that, that, you know, I mean, George F. Walker has, has consistently come back to Hamilton yeah. and put and premiered shows of his there, mm. uh, at the Pearl. So, so there is, there is interest. There is interest in a lot of those spaces. I mean, I guess I just wish that there was more of a sense. There was more of a sense of, of, of theater creators on all levels wanting to take risks. Mm, yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe part of this is, is my ignorance. Like I, I, I know that, that Aquarius, I know the artistic director of Aquarius tries to program as much as he can within the mandate that he's given. I mean, sure. I mean, Ron is, has gone on record saying, you know, like one of my favorite places, the pillow man, but you know, I don't know that I could, 
I don't know that I could program it and get audiences in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, you know, he's, I mean, they did, they did, they did Blackbird mm-hmm. this past, this past season, this past season. It got a, t- got a ton of press, got a lot of outrage. Yeah. But it also got a lot of people in the community going out saying it was really well done, which it was. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so, so there is, so there is a recognition of, mm-hmm. of, of, you know, we need to do stuff that, that, that is more topical or more risky. Yeah. Um, I always look at the community theaters and I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate because, uh, a lot of times their, their venues that could attract more audiences. Sure. If, you know, if, if, if they, if, if they got more independent artists involved, like if, uh, if, if say the players guild invited a number of, of smaller uh, mm-hmm. theater companies and hosted them sure. in their season and said, well, we're going to have this group in here and they'll put on a show as part of our main season. Right. Like if that started happening more yeah. often, then you, I think you would get a little more attention. Like sure. it's just because we, it's just, I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, even in Toronto, there are a lot of, a lot of community groups that have like these really amazing spaces that they're basically are, are, that are dedicated. Yeah. You know, you look at you look at alumni theater, but alumni has has also managed to like they you can rent, the, you know, and you can there they can be a roadhouse sometimes. It's true, can, it's true. You know, I mean alumni, but I mean I always look at alumni as like I mean I just I just wrapped up a show at, at mm. New Ideas, and I'm just like I I I'm in awe of the stuff that they do. Yeah, like, I mean holy crap, they they're ent- almost their entire season this year was like new stuff, mm. it was new work. I'm like yeah, yeah. crazy, like mm. holy crap. Um. And so I think, you know, there's no reason for community theater to not do new work or sure. locally created stuff. Um, but even, but, but I guess that the, the odd thing about Toronto, obviously, is that there is, there is a sense of artistic, uh, curation involved. Sure. Yeah. And, and creation, uh, nurturing artists, giving them a home and, and, and giving them space to, to work on stuff, to try to fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't see the the creation of space in Hamilton as as there yet. Yeah. And I think that's that's the real sure. That's the real drawback for sure. Me is um, is getting you know giving artists residencies, giving artists places to just play. Sure, you need to have space if you're going to you do if you're going to create. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you know because then you know then can people people can try out new work and yeah. So, so I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a puzzle. It's a yeah. puzzle creating, yeah, yeah, yeah. creating in the town. And sometimes yeah. I feel a bit, it's, I go in there and I think, oh yeah, it's like, I, I sometimes feel like I'm back in, back in my twenties. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, I'm not, I'm 20 years older than yeah. that. So. so yeah. Um, but you know, as I, I, also on, on the other hand, I, I, I sometimes feel now like I'm in a place where I'm able to better define my idea of what success is. Hmm. Um, whereas I sometimes thought when I was working here in Toronto, I was kind of working against the general idea of what success was. Right? Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I, I still, I still sort of have fights with myself, right? Like, um, you know, like, am I? is this still something I want to do? Mm. You know, like, you know, this show only got, only got seen once. So I'd like, really like to see it again. So, but I mean, it is, it is nice at least being able to be part of a company that's lasted, you know, sort yeah. of longer than, you know, that's long, that's lasted. I think we're going on, uh, almost five years, hmm. 14, four years. Yeah. So we're into, we're into our fourth year now. That's good. Which is, which is yeah, I think it's yeah. like the longest, I think that's the longest mm. I've become a, been a part of, of any sort of um, any company, really. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, what is? I mean, you were part of your season, part of the this does this, this this umbrella group. Does it have a name, or is it just like? No, we're 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 indie theater uh, Hamilton Indie Theater Collective. We mm. haven't come up with a name yet. That's, yeah. I mean, it literally it just started as a conversation sure. that we had around Christmas. That was, you know, like how do we how do we work together and help yeah. each other? Cause otherwise all we're going to be doing is programming our own stuff and potentially losing money and, yeah. Yeah. and getting tired because we're trying to wear too many hats. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Instead, you can you can like combine resources and work together. That's to, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That basically the gist of it yeah. is to is to work is to is to basically boost in a productive, practical mm-hmm. way, right? Like if they're if one see if this one company is producing a show, then we're like, well, we'll we'll send out your press releases or we'll sure you know handle your marketing and your tweets, right? Yeah, um, that sort of thing, or we'll yeah. handle box office the night that that you're running. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, or ushers or what have you. Mm-hmm. Nice. I think that's that's kind of that's the general gist yeah. of it. And is test going to be the uh, the same boat contribution, or is that something yeah. you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Test is going to be uh, same boat. We're we're hoping the plan is to do it in October, just mm-hmm. to kind of capitalize on on Halloween and uh, and yeah and uh, yeah. So it's uh, that's that's the first that's the first plan, and and yeah, we'll see how that goes. Well, test. I mean. Test has has come a long way since <laughs> it sure um, has. I first looked at it because yeah, you were, like, the, you were the first director. Yeah, it was like ten minutes long. That's with, right, with the, the Monkey long. Man Festival. Yeah, um, and when you wrote it, it was kind of a sequel. It was. Yeah, it was a sequel or prequel. It was like a sequel. It to, was. It was. It was a sequel to Out yeah. of Character, which yeah. you know I will go on record as saying I don't. I did not really feel good about Out of Character. Mm. I well, it was written at a very bad time in my life, and I probably should not have staged it and what have you. But <laughs> no, seriously, I like. I look back and I go, really, if I could take back anything, mm. it would be to take back this particular show. Mm. Um, but no, I, 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 out of out of what I the lessons I learned from that production went into what I, mm. what I actually wanted to say with Tess. Right. Uh, and then from that 10 minute play came, came something longer. Uh, and, and yeah. And, and, uh, and then that kind of has been sort of, uh, through the, through a number of years, just yeah. distilled and distilled. And, and yeah. can you, can you describe test? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a it's a play about uh, about two uh, live action role play role players, who um, the 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 premise now is that you, and you'll love this. It's okay, like yeah, the yeah. Premise yeah. now is they're actually at a convention, mm-hmm. and the audience is a bunch of gamers who are like like first time gamers who don't really know much about the hobby at all. Sure. So it's Drew and Dana basically telling the audience about LARPing. And, and the rules of LARPing. But as they tell the, the story of the rules of LARPing, they get into just telling the story about their relationship. Okay. And so mm. that's when it kind of turns into a story about, well, this is, this is what happened with us. No, that's not actually what happened. You're telling the story wrong. Right. It's like this. No, it's like this. Hmm. Um, yeah. So it, it, and it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of meta in, in a lot of ways where, you know, and it's kind of minimalist. Mm. So, you know, I, I, so I think there, there's a lot of there's a lot of giants that I was standing on the shoulders of mm-hmm. when I when I wrote this piece. Mm-hmm. Um, I had actually just come back from a uh, a workshop with Daniel McIver in mm-hmm. uh, in Banff, mm-hmm. uh, and and a lot of the things that that I had worked worked on and some of the things he had talked about there kind of went into test about yeah. you know being unabashedly aware of the fa- of the fact that you're in a play, right? Well, that you're telling a play. I mean. That is one of the things that I think is is talked about in Jordan Tannehill's uh, Theater of the Unimpressed. Yep, absolutely. And about like, who are we? And I, I have and I, more in solo plays, but now more and more, I'm like, who am I? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially, I find especially in a solo play, like, I need to know, mm-hmm. like, who are you and why are you talking to me? Like, <laughs> who am I and why are you talking to me? Right, right, right. Um, yeah. But I do appreciate in in theater when it, there's like some kind of acknowledgement, not necessarily that it's a play, but that like I am talking in this room and there's yeah. people, and you are you, you and are you exactly, yeah. Um, I appreciated uh, 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 Tamlin's play where uh, uh, at Fringe two years ago when she was like, because her premise was like these are the three seconds between when my boyfriend asked me to marry him. Mm-hmm. And I tell oh, him no. Yeah, and you are the aspects of my brain, you audience, and we're gonna work. Th- like this is what that is. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So the you have uh, the two characters, Drew and Dana, and they're yeah. 
they're like inst- which I think is a good idea because mo- some of your audience much of your audience is not going to know what LARPing is so it's good that they are first time LARPers yeah, yeah yeah for sure for sure mm. so yeah and it, I mean it's, it's I always I think we we intended on producing it uh, was it la- no not last year mm. the year before and then our plans fell through for that mm. and uh but I still had the script. I still had the revised script kicking yeah. around. So, mm. um, and it was always something that Aaron uh, really wanted to do. So once we, once we're finished, your own sons, which mm. wraps at the end of April, mm. then we'll we'll start on this. What is what is your own sons? Because that's that's I mean something that I mean this is going to go up uh, in time for that. So I want to talk like what is what is your own sons? Well, your own sons is is a play I started. Uh, so it, it it's a play about about ra- that tackles the subject of radicalization mm. um, in uh, in Western youth, right? Radicalization right. Uh, with regards to ISIS, right? Right. right. That you know, so, so home, so homegrown radicalization. Mm-hmm. Um, it was born really. The impetus for the play uh, came out of. Out of out of an sort of an awareness on my part of of you know this the tendency for for you know young white boys mm-hmm. young Western boys yeah uh, you know from Canada states France all over Europe to decide to up and join ISIS mm. to like mainly go go to places like Syria or Iraq mm-hmm. uh, or Egypt yeah. um, and and take up this cause. Mm. Uh, and, but it, but it wasn't something that sort of, I, I went, it, w- it was just kind of a, a kind of a, a, a subject matter that I, that I was interested in and, and was sort of uh, researching a little bit, but it didn't sort of hit home until um, 2014 uh, when the, uh, when the shooting attacks in Ottawa took mm. place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that of course, uh, that was um uh the young man uh michael zahaf bebo who you know uh stormed the the war memorial yeah sean killed nathan cirillo who was from hamilton uh and then attacked uh stormed the parliament buildings yeah. and i thought i just the the impact of that the impact of of that hit me for a number of reasons i mean First of all, it was in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, and I always, you know, part of me is always like, I recognize that part of my heart, part of my myself will always yeah. be in that city. Well, you're, you're, you're originally from I'm Ottawa. originally yeah, from yeah. there. Um, and actually, you know, the year, that year, the year, a year before I had spent a lot of time in Ottawa because my mom was, was dying yeah. uh, from cancer. And I recalled several times walking back from the, the palliative hospital where she was passing by the war memorial, mm. right? Like it's a very meditative place. Yeah. And so, you know, you had this terribly violent incident that took place um, directly connected to the city where I am now. Yeah. Um, and the outpouring of, of grief and emotion that took that that happened in Hamilton in the wake of this really can't be overstated. Mm. Like, I mean, we had, you know, there were there were flags up everywhere. There were there were somber marches up and down the streets there was i mean you know the 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 funeral procession for for corporal sorello um was attended by pretty much the whole damn city yeah. uh you know mm. winding its way through the streets until you, you hit the armory mm. which is just down the street from where i was working yeah uh, so so it was a pretty it was a pretty profound and very deep-seated grief mm. uh that that caused a lot of reflection on my part and it really was the first i really felt very much compelled to write about it mm. and, and you know one of the things that i've asked myself a lot as a writer these past few years is like what type of stories can i tell what type of stories do i have a right to tell mm. you know and it's a big thing that we've seen a lot of this year in particular this past year yeah you know like who's who has proprietary rights over telling a certain story yeah um, you know, and I was interested in telling a story about, you know, the, about radicalization because mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's, it's an important issue, but I wasn't really sure sort of what, how it affected me or how it impacted me. And then I realized, well, for crying out loud, I'm, I'm a white man. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the age of television. Yeah. I grew up 
you know, I, I, the internet came about when I was in university, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I liked playing with GI Joe and yeah. watching star Wars and, and playing video games when I was a kid. And I just thought, Jesus, like, you know, they're there for the grace of God. Yeah. Go I, right. And yeah. then what also happened around that time too, like shortly after that time was, um, uh, Leanne and I had, uh, had our second child. Yeah. It was Brendan, our mm. son. And I was, I, when we had Becca, our daughter, I was, I was overjoyed and she's like the apple of my, uh, mm -hmm. apple of my eye. But honestly, when we had our son, I was absolutely terrified Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I found myself going, what, you know, asking these questions about what type, you know, questions about like masculinity yeah. and, you know, what is masculinity and what is the identity of being a man? Yeah. What type of lessons am I imparting? Can I be imparting? You know, and, and what type of father am I going to be to a boy? Yeah. Right? So those were like really deep questions that, that I was confronted with. So I started I started with the play and the first character was was a was a mother mm -hmm. who who lost her son to radicalization, which was very much inspired by by a number of stories of these so called ISIS mothers. Mm -hmm. Um you know, mothers all across the world, essentially, whose whose sons have have left. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've been radic They've been basically self radicalized by, you know, watching things on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. surfing the internet. But it's not just that. It's you know, there are deeper problems involved. Sure. There's psychological issues. That was certainly the case with Zahav Bibo. Um, you know, there's trauma. There's childhood trauma. There's loss of parental figures. Sure. Um, probably the most direct example. The direct uh, sort of identifier uh, that we found was a woman named Christiane Boudreau, who was a, a Calgary mother who lost her son Damien right. uh, to uh, to radicalization, and and so and we were very lucky during our run of the fringe last year. We um, we uh, we met, we got into correspondence with her oh. about it, um, and it was it was it was quite it was quite humbling. Hmm. But also quite sad too, hmm. just like understanding, understanding what was going, you know, the, the, these, these are real stories, right? Yeah. So, and, but then the other, the other side of the, the, the other side of your own sons was, you know, an idea about, about being a father. And I, I, I play a hmm. father in, in, in the story of hmm. father to uh, a boy who, or a young man who joins the, the military. Right. And that for me was this other aspect of like, you know, how do you handle if you're a person who's traditionally not, you know, had sort of a, a complex relationship, shall we say, with, with the military, sure. the idea of military. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, and, 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 you know, you have a, you have a son who decides to join and to yeah. serve and, you know, maybe serve in a capacity that you as a parent might not approve of. What yeah. does that look like? How do you deal with it? So, so anyways, the, the, so we, we as a company started, started kind of thinking about this, this project and I started writing it. I got a, I got a creator's grant, mm -hmm. uh, from the OAC with the Aquarius for it. Uh, and then we applied for a city of Hamilton, uh, arts grant to develop it. And we got that. And then we entered into the fringe yeah. thinking, well, maybe we'll enter the fringe and we can develop it there. Sure. And we got into the fringe and. So we produced it last year, the 20, 2017 uh, Hamilton Fringe, yeah. and it did really well. Mm. Um, I wasn't really sure, you know. Like I, I, it's I always feel like whenever I put whenever I put a play up in Hamilton, I'm like, oh, no one's gonna come and see this. No one's gonna be interested. <laughs> well, no, seriously, like yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah. like what, like what, like 2015, I wrote a play. I were I wrote a play about a conservative, you know, like I, I, at your playwrights yeah, retreat. Yeah. I wrote yeah. a play. I wrote a play inspired by the Mike Duffy. Yeah, yeah, Second yeah. Scandal. I'm like, yeah. no one's gonna come and see this. I'm yeah. playing. I'm playing like a cipher for Ni Nigel Wright. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm a you know a backroom dealer for Stephen Harper. Like, no one is interest. No one in Hamilton is interested in seeing you know an hour in the life of of a, of a guy on Parliament Hill. Sure, but they seem to like it. Oh, well. Then I was like, okay, so are people gonna come see a play about? You know, a feel good mm. play about you know a mother and her radicalized son. Sure. Um, but, you know, I think I always underestimate my audiences because I, I genuine, genuinely people came, came to see it and, and were quite moved. And, and that was really yeah. nice to see. I sometimes think that, that, that 
fear can be a good thing. Hmm. Fear of like, will anybody come to see this? If I was to, if if I wrote a thing and I was like, everybody's going to come and see this, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like how can they not? And suddenly I'm going to be like, that nobody, nobody shows, shows up. up. But if you have that fear of like. Uh, man, what if nobody comes? Then at least you're like you work at like yeah. making sure people go, people come. I would hate to be the guy who's like, well, you know, I'm Phil Rickaby, so people are gonna come <laughs> and see my play. Because then I'd be like, I am just waiting for for the opportunity to just have nobody come. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's it you know, so it took me by surprise, and and uh, and we always went into the fringe. Oh, this was the thing. Mm. We went into the fringe this year. Uh, basically I'm unabashedly saying, listen, this is a workshop. Uh, mm. This is not going to be the finished product. Yeah. This is like a work print. Like here we're, we're, the, we're doing the basic sketch out of the story. Yeah. And that, and that for me felt really freeing because it was like, you know, this isn't good. This isn't the perfect play. This isn't the well-made play. There's going to sure. be rough around the edges. Yeah. How are people going to respond to it? Oh, okay. And the feedback we got, we got like a lot of it, we 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 incorporated into the development of this piece. Mm. But even this piece that we're doing isn't like, I mean, it's more finished, it's sure. more polished. But even then, it's like we uh, we went into rehearsal this past this past week, and we were, you know, like I delivered the finished mm. draft two weeks ago. But even then, we were like, okay, cut this, cut that, yeah. cut this, cut that. I mean, the piece makes use of like choral episodes yeah. where like all the cast are talking in unison. And it was, and it was really interesting. I went into that sort of bracing myself, like, oh, we're going to make all these cuts and they're really going to hurt and be painful. Mm. Um, but it was quite, it was quite interesting because I realized at one point in time, it was, um, you know, we, we made some changes here and there and all of a sudden it felt like, oh, this is what the piece is. Mm. This is where it lives. Mm. Um, and we're doing it at the Pearl. So there's a different vibe yeah. than, than the rush, rush, rush to, yeah. To fringe and the oh, we're, we're we're not in competition, but we're sort of in competition with other yeah. plays. And oh, we gotta we gotta champion this mm. piece. And you know, like there was there's there's sometimes that vibe too with festivals. Like I find, mm. especially if they're if they're yeah, like if if you're in, if you're in a theater festival, you're like, well, you know, we got to give away all these free tickets in order to make sure that people come and and who's getting who's getting sure. what coverage and yeah. things like that. And and. And I, I find I really much prefer producing in an independent streak mm. because mm. at least, you know, there's a sense of, okay, we're doing it and it's here and it's yeah. in this space. Mm -hmm. Mind you, okay, here's the crazy part though. Like we're going our, our last week of production. There's like four or five different things happening in, in Hamilton mm. theater at the mm. same time. Wow. One of which is one of my shows. It's going up at, at this 10 minute play fest <laughs> down the street. I won't get to see it, but, uh, mm. it was actually the same piece that was at alumni this yeah. past, uh, Hmm. this past month so so hence my my thing my statement that i'm yeah. busy yeah, yeah, ryan yeah. is actually di directing it nice so. nice so yeah yeah it, it, see i i i i like fringe um as a i tend to be more towards the like i don't see the the competition aspect so much um and maybe that's my my altruistic nature i tend to see um I go in with the, there's audience enough for everyone. Um, yeah. and, but again, you make alliances mm -hmm. at a fringe festival. Mm -hmm. You make choices about like, if you're doing a curtain speech. Yeah. You make choices about what you're going to you do, what you're you, going to promote. Yeah, so you, you make do. those you alliances and you're like, I'm shouting out your show, but you shout out my show. You know, the service mm -hmm. really like your show. Can I shout it out? We shout out my show. You make these, these sort of, these sort of choices. I guess, I guess for me, it, 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 it sometimes harkens back to sort of the, I, you know, I, you know, I freely admit, you know, the, the anxiety of like, you know, have I made something that's like that people are actually mm. going to come and see? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I remember the, the first fringe show I did was at the Ottawa fringe and the first show that, that I ever did first goddamn show, there were more people on stage than there were in the audience. Oh, that's it was the, the worst. The most <clears throat> painful, mm. it was the most painful memory. Of mm. like, oh God, this is, this is really not good. You know, and it's not, but so you're, you know, it, it, but it's not that, that I begrudge any of the other shows. Sure. Certainly not. Um, I just, I just, you know, it, it's just that there's the nature of the beast. Like, yeah. I think, I think your biggest critic is always yourself. Oh, right? sure. Like, so, you know, are people, 
like you, you know, you read the description, the description of your show, and it's like, oh god, no one's going to come and see this. Oh, this one, this one looks really mm. fun. Yeah, I did. You know, if I was if, if I was choosing the first show to see, oh no, I for sure would see this one. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, one, yeah. Not mine, okay? yeah. So I don't know. It's, I, I, I think my this, neurosis always plays. Oh, like sure. Really well. those, those fringe descriptions are always difficult to write. You know, it's like how possible to write. How do I how do I write a thing that gives somebody a sense of what the show is, but not too much gives too much away, makes a show sound like you really want to see it. You know, like in like three or four sentences. Yeah, finding appropriate appropriate pull quotes yes. is always the challenge. Oh shit! Yeah, <laughs> yes. People pay attention to pull quotes, but they can't be out of thin air. Right? No, like, they have to be real. They have to be in context. Yes. Like, yeah, yes. So it's mm. it's it's tricky. Yeah, you know, it's why it's 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 why you're in a good position if at least you've garnered some positive reviews over the over the course of like five years. Oh, or sure. Something. But I mean, uh, then yeah. it's like if you're debuting a new show, is it is are all your pull quotes about like you as a performer? Right. That's it. Like, that's all you can do. You know, it's like that's uh, all you yeah. can do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. And even then, I like I feel a bit self conscious. Like, oh, I can't do this. Like, I can't, like, I don't think Aaron, like Aaron's. I don't think is a, a fan of that. He's like, can we just not use pull quotes? Uh, we have to like use it. Like, you no, do no, have no. to use them. <laughs> and you know, it's, I'm still I'm still at the point where I'm like, you know, I, I don't like to talk. Like, it's like, oh, what are you working on? I start staring at staring at my shoes and stuff. I'm not yet at the point where I'm like ready to, right? to boost. Yeah, my yeah, own yeah, stuff. yeah. Then, absolutely. But that's exactly what you have to do. Is like. You know, if you get those five stars, you've got to talk about those five stars. Or if you're selling out, you're selling out. You yeah. got to tell people about it. You know, for sure, for sure. Um, but you know, it's 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 there's a certain awkwardness with mm-hmm. doing that. It's mm-hmm. it can be difficult to to walk up or to to be like, you know what, my show is great. <laughs> you, you should know? come and see. You this should show. come and see my it's show. Awesome, it's great. <laughs> it's. Awesome. Would be the best thing you see. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And yet there are people who don't have a problem with that. Like I'll watch some people work magic at a fringe line, who are just like somehow Man, I don't they're know how just anybody like anybody does it. I don't know. I don't know how anybody does it. It's Seriously. it's like the. I mean, I haven't. I'm nowhere near like good at it because I have to like breathe into a paper bag before I walk up to a line of people. Right. And, like be like, okay, I can do this, you know, and then like start talking about this show. That I'm doing. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I never got this in, in Toronto, but I've heard, oh, it's the worst. Like, I've been in line for French shows in Toronto and somebody critiques somebody's line pitch. You know, um, if you had said that at the beginning of your pitch, I'd be more inclined to see your show. Or what? Like, I've oh, never shit, encountered yeah, like, that. Oh, shit. It's like the worst thing to have somebody be like, here's my show. And somebody goes, you know what? Your, your pitch could be better. Holy. And it's like, uh... You know what, sir? You do this. Here, take my flyers and you show me how it's done and sell my show. See, the one I always get is, yeah, we've already made our choices for to see French. Mm. We don't really have time to see this. Thanks. There's that one. That's um, the one I always hear. Uh, when I was in, when I was doing the last man on earth in Calgary, we got. Um, oh, I've already no, no. I'm not going to see your show. <laughs> like it was the only place where some people would look you in the eye and go, "I'm not coming to see your show." Wow. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I had somebody say, they gave me the flyer back and they said, save the tree. I was like, tree died. The tree's dead. It's already dead. This is dead. This, the tree can no longer the be ink saved. has been printed. I wanted to explain to people, do you understand the transaction here? The transaction is I give you a flyer. You take the flyer. <laughs> and then I don't know if you come to the show. You do not have to look me in the eye and crush all my <laughs> dreams and say, I'm not coming to see your show. You can smile and nod and take this thing. And then as soon as I'm out of eye shot, you can throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the garbage. There. I don't need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You do not need to crush all my hopes and dreams today. <sighs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Brutal. Um, Brutal. With... We we talked about like where your inspiration for your own sons came from, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you started writing that at one of the writing retreats, or you were working on. I did, or, yeah, or? yeah. I started that. That was uh, yeah. that was at the second yeah. time I did your writers retreat. Um, I worked on when when you're writing something, and I mean, do you do you how much planning do you do? Or do you just sort of like take the paper and like you've got the idea and you just sort of take a run at it and worry about playing uh, planning later? Oh God, no! No, I'm I'm much more of a planner. I <laughs> and that comes all the way back to when I first started writing plays. Mm. Um, I didn't really learn 
how I didn't really learn playwriting in any sort of, you know, educational course. Sure. Um, I took a couple of classes at, at when I was in school, but mm. at that point in time, I was I was learning directing and dramaturgy. Sure. So I was learning, I was learning theater. I think from a, from a from a much more constructive, not constructive, but a much more um, uh, from a planning perspective, right? Mm. Like, you know, these these are the structure, these are the dramatic structures. This is the dramatic structure within the within the play. You know, these are the characters. These are the roles the characters play. Mm-hmm. You know, from a dramaturgical perspective, and I and this was Canadian, like the Canadian dramaturgy, as yeah. opposed to sort of your European dramaturgy uh, or uh, sort of American dramaturgy, which is more about like what's the background of the play mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. you know time period and thing like that. Yeah. Whereas Canadian dramaturgy is much more about has kind of morphed into this much more to a. a uh, play development sure. standpoint. So I was learning dramaturgy from the standpoint of, you know, developing a show, mm. right? Like developing a play. So once again, I was, I was looking at structure and plot and mm. character. Uh, so I was, I was always much more interested in the dynamics of a scene, right? Sure. So, you know, I'd look at a scene and go, okay, here, here's the beats. Mm. Here's the, the wins and losses. Here's where the status changes. Mm. So when I got to writing plays, I, I came at it from a very planning standpoint. Okay. Mm. Um, you know, there was a there was a great playwriting book I still go back to, um, which was you know had had all of, it was an outline, right? It was like mm. here's the name of the play, character, main character, supporting character. What's the setting? What's the occasion? Mm. What's the dramatic premise? Sure. How does it manifest in action? Yeah. Um, and when I when I started doing that, it kind of kept me on track because uh, really, I hate plot. Like I'm like plots a very, it's a very nefarious, mm-hmm. nebulous thing for me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I, I always, I always worry when I look at my plays. I'm like, oh well, how does this scene lean into the other? Because, 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 right? But yeah. but then I also like I'll I'll see I'll see some plays and. It's not like oh this narrative thing leads directly into this narrative thing. Mm. It's a vet that's it's not as sure. prescriptive in that sense. Yeah. But I'm not I also don't like doing freeform stuff. Mm. Because mm. I find I I don't know. I I find that it it I work better with some sort of an end goal in sure. mind. Yeah. Um you know, but that, you know, that being said, when I was working on, when I was working at the, uh, the retreat on Your Own Sons, mm-hmm. I kind of was like, well, these are some of the sh- scenes that I, sure. I need to do. Uh, or when I was doing Mr. Right, I was like, uh, back, basically, it was just back and forth between, you know, yeah. Nathan and Shelley, boom, 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 right? Which, which was a lot of fun, right? Um, but no, I, I usually, mm-hmm. Like I love scene cards. I yeah, love yeah. the cue cards and just putting them on the cork board. Yeah, and going. Yeah, that kind of works in that way, in that way, in that mm. way. Um, mm. But writing since I since I've been doing my MFA this past year, writing in different forms mm-hmm. presents different challenges. Mm. Right, like writing fiction is is a very strange beast. Yeah, uh, uh, challenging in a lot of ways. Um, not as complicated as as playwriting, though, in other ways. Hmm. Uh, like one of the things I've, I've noticed, you know, in, in fiction, you can write like two or three pages of a character who's like standing still and observing the world and yeah. reacting. Mm. Whereas in a play, that's dead. Yeah, that's death. Yeah. Mm. So it's it's and it's it's interesting, you know, like what's the, what's the stereotype like? Never write a play about a writer. Oh, you know, and how, yeah. how much fiction is about writers. Oh, like so much. Right. Yeah. But it works because, it, it works you because know, it, it, on the page you can, people can watch things mm-hmm. and it's very difficult to just like not move and watch things on, on stage. Yeah. Um, I'm, I tend to be more of a, a seat of your pants writer. Um, generally I've noticed that. Yeah. I've noticed that. Yeah. That's generally how I write. Um, whether it and you know what I, I I tend to like just take a run at something and then like editing I mean yes editing becomes a bitch when you take a run at something and you then have to fix it later but that's 
just the way it works. But doesn't it you know? feel great when you finish that first draft? Oh fuck, it that's feels like so amazing. Best. That's I right? realized I realized what's like someone asked me, what's your favorite part of playwriting? I'm like, finish the first finishing the first draft. Finishing the that first feeling, draft is the finish is the absolutely best. the best. Feeling. It is the best. Um <laughs> starting to edit that first draft is less is less, less exciting. So. It's less exciting. That's why you have to have a glass of wine after. I always give myself like two to three weeks before I start to, to oh, edit. Oh man, what a luxury. I always I like, wish I did that. I finish it and then I'm like, I need to step away. God, I should do that. And I then I come back at it like after I've got some distance. Once I don't feel like once being like, oh, this bit's garbage doesn't quite hurt so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I have distance from it. Right. I can be a little more brutal with my writing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not precious about it anymore. See, it's interesting. I don't, since, since I've basically, I've acted in almost all the stuff that I've written mm. with the, with the exception of just a handful of stuff. Mm. I think I'm sometimes far more brutal mm. on myself in the, in the rewrite process. Like I, one of the things that we were going through rehearsal mm. this past week, I, I, I said to Aaron, listen, I'm, I'm in the room as an actor. And he's like, I know. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, yeah. So free reign. He's like, thanks. Good to know. Yeah. And I was like, cut, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. cut, 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 cut. And I'm like, okay, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Cause I always find that at least for me, once I'm on the stage, mm. my, I think my ability to sort of, uh, trust in the words yeah. isn't always, isn't always as on point mm-hmm. as opposed to if I'm sitting in the chair watching what's happening. Sure. What I've actually found is like the first time that I, if like if it's solo piece, if I read it for somebody or the first time that I have people read it, I'm like, nope. If I'm, if I'm like reading my own solo piece, then I'm like, I edit on the fly. I'm like, no, this is not working. Yeah. It's not working, mm-hmm. but I can, I can be so much brutal hearing it than reading it. I'm so much more forgiving if I can just, if I'm looking at the page, but right, as soon as people yeah. are reading it, you're like, Oh no, no, that is not working. Yeah. I, I've also realized that, uh, first reads of mm. my work are terrifying. Oh, always, always. I didn't always. think that. No, I didn't think that was the case, but, but it was, it's only something I've become aware of in the last few years mm. that when I give a, give a piece that's never been read before to be read, it's like I actually exhibit like yeah. anxiety signs. Even if it's just like if there's no audience except for the actors, I'm still like, yeah, I'm yeah, like absolutely so fidgety and yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Because I, this is like the first time that it doesn't exist in my head, and that somebody needs to make sense of the words that because I know what all this stuff means, yeah, but doesn't mean something for somebody else, and yeah. that that's where it becomes like what if it doesn't mean what I think it means? You know, what if, what <laughs> yeah, if yeah. none of it makes any sense anymore? You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it was it quite, yeah. And I, I think I, I've, I've gained a lot of use in, in recording these, mm. these first read sessions and the feedback mm. because I can't take notes after these things. Like it's, it's, yeah. I try, but I just, I, I become too, you know, all I do is like cut and maybe make small notes and it doesn't yeah. serve me well. No, enough. no. So when, so it, like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, a lot of the, the, the evolution of your own sons came, came from sort of post first read discussions mm. where I just like pressed record on my phone and went, Oh, Oh, that's a really good point there. Yeah. That's a good point. I find those discussions are super helpful, but yeah. it's a good idea to record them. Cause like, you, I get caught up in the discussion. That's what I mean. And yeah. I assume I'm going to remember it. And, then and you was never a, do. There was something I was yeah. supposed to remember here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how have you felt that your own sons, like what's been the biggest change in it? From the fringe From to the, this one? Yeah. Uh, the biggest change has the, been the expansion of the character of Dan, who's the father mm. that I'm playing. Um, Dan in the, in the last in the last show in the, that we did in the fringe, Dan, Dan's role was essentially as this ghost on stage reciting this monologue. Mm. And then sort of he manifested at the end and was someone that, that the character of Pauline, the mother sort of encounters at the end. Um, and he was sort of always on the sidelines. He, he was on the sidelines in this, this role. We basically tackled him as, as, as another, as another character on stage who was interacting with, with uh 
characters of it, you know, characters in it, in his life on mm. his own journey to towards discovery. Sure. So what's happening now is you is you essentially have instead of instead of just Pauline sort of confronting these different characters mm. uh, and Dan kind of being this. I don't know, this wandering planet, if you will, in orbit. It, it's really kind of like the two of them mm. are in orbit around each other until at the very end, they kind of find each other. And, and we're, the, we're really able to spend more time with him. Mm. Um, that being said, his, I'm finding that the scenes that I've written for Dan still have on, on almost a very short, sharp, episodic feel to them. Sure. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. It, it it may because because in some ways he still is a bit of a newer character. Yeah. Maybe just because you know he's he's a character that's in deep deep grief, mm. and you know there's I think there's only so long that that sort of carries on like sure. that that can be played. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, the expansion of Dan and and also the the, the use of the. The, the other characters, mm. which is basically the other four characters, as uh, functioning as kind of a chorus. So there's cast doubling that's mm. going on, which mm. is something I always like. Mm. I always enjoy that in pieces. When does it open? It opens April 19th at the Pearl Company. Uh, yeah, and it runs for two weeks. So uh, April 19th, 20th, and 21st. Mm -hmm. uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then the following week, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's 26th, 27th, and 28th. Nice. On the 28th, mm -hmm. we have a matinee. We have one matinee. We're going to try it. See if we try can a matinee, matinee. See what comes out. See yeah. what comes out. Yeah. Uh, have you never? Have you not? Have you not tried matinee? We have tried yet? matinee actually. Yeah. And, and uh, two years ago, our our company did uh, did an American play called Two Rooms, and we had a had a matinee mm. on Saturday, and it did really well. Mm. So I don't see. I don't anticipate there'll be that much of an issue. Cool. Um, yeah. It, it, I think it's going to be... I look forward to it. Nice. I look forward to Good. it. Nice. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for, for talking with me well, today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Phil. It's been a real pleasure uh, talking with you. And This has been a Homebody Productions production.